and gentlemen, and welcome to another just Yelta Confusion Thursday Night Hangout. It's Thursday. Are you sure? Just how sure are you? Is it Thursday? Is it really Thursday? Gosh, I hope so, because if it's not, uh, that's people are getting a bonus. How about that? The extra Thursday you didn't know that you actually needed. I exactly. think we might be on to something, actually. Exactly, exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, I, of course, am your host, Charlie, and I'm joined once again by the Clifford Conner himself, Zelius. Greetings, my good people of the internet. Greetings, greetings. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Thursday Hangout. This is a live show. We try our best to cover the topics most important to you. If at any point during the show uh, you have a topic or a question or opinion or just a thought uh, that you'd like to add to the show, by all means, drop it in to whatever flavor of chat you have, be it Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch. Um, if we do, unfortunately, run out of time for your topic or question, we will add it to the very next show. Now. Let us jump into it. And to start off, here's some news that's kind of been in the rumor mill for a long time. And this is still technically a rumor, but there are developers out there right now, at this very right. moment, this very moment, that are claiming that they have already received their development kit for... Um, a new Nintendo system. A new Switch 2? Yes. A Nintendo 2? A, a Switch 2. Wow. I'll be curious to see what the future leaks that come out of the power, the format, the configuration, the backwards compatibility, all the fun stuff. Absolutely. I, I, I too, want to know all about that because I, I will probably jump in early because, yeah... Well, you love your Switch. Oh, I do. I do. And, and I know that I've said this story before, but I'm going to say it again. The Switch was a, a system that I had n I had no uh, intention of buying for myself and playing. I, I found two Switches during the time where Switches were rare, and I was going to turn around and sell them for big money. And I ended up selling one, and I kept the other. And I can't complain. I love me. Remember switch. when they were, you know, years ago now, when they were talking about the switch and like it being the handheld, we were, I remember an Ultra Confusion was actually pretty skeptical of the switch. I was thinking durability with it being well, a the, handheld. Yeah, we just, I remember we weren't high on it. Yep. Um, as if, you know, for whatever reasons, um, just weren't incredibly high on it. Um, retrospect, I was obviously very wrong. You know. <laughs> so, but I'm glad it did well because always having competition in any ecosystem is always a good thing. Yep. Um, I mean, it would be a bad thing, I think, if it was only Nintendo and Sony with successful hardware consoles because uh, then it's truly like a unified. I mean, I know there's some exclusives, but as far as the format, pretty damn close. Um, so still have Nintendo being very successful is a good thing for gamers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's all it's going to be. It's only going to improve the overall gaming system. Um, and I know people always complain about the Switch not being powered enough. And I think we've shown over the Switch's uh, lifespan that it's fine. Yeah. Um, it's, would super high def graphics be great? Sure. But at the same time... You also want the magnificent battery life that you get on the Switch. Or the or, quality of the games that are on the Switch, especially if they're yeah, from Nintendo. Yeah, and it goes back to also showing that, like, having super AAA, okay, I guess they call called Nintendo games AAA quality, but, like, having, like, the true cutting-edge PS5 graphics and the true Xbox yeah. One graphics are not necessary to create a successful game because in the end, I think as long as the graphics are decent, Gameplay still trumps graphics in so many ways. Agreed. Um, and maybe in a roundabout way, not having the most uber graphics does require developers to think about the gameplay maybe a little bit more than they did before. Maybe it's wishful thinking. I don't know. Right, right. Um, but I think the success is proven. Um, so I guess the speculation, because, you know, why the hell not? <laughs> is the Switch 2 going to be a further iteration of the handheld device, or is it going to be something totally unexpected? Because, like, nobody expected them to go from, you know, 
the console we we u format to the handheld was totally out of left field yeah um at the time so what do you think do you think they're going to continue the handheld with you know you can dock and that good stuff or is it going to be like learn a year from now like what the hell that was unsurprising or that was actually surprising i should say no i i think that they they have proved that they can marry a console and a handheld into one device and i think they continue to do that i would be i am i would be very interested to see if they have the detachable joy cons mm. in the next year or because those things are what I, to my in my opinion that's like the switch's weak spot is the joy cons because if you put some serious gaming into it you're gonna have drift issues because those anal those you know those analogs just can't keep up with it so it's just though because like so i went skiing with a group of buddies a couple months ago mm -hmm. and one of the perks, and I think this is why they would actually keep some version of the Joy-Con, is it then became a, good group, a big group party of playing Mario Kart and other games. Right. Because, I mean, it's super easy with one person to use the stupid little tiny Joy-Con to play with. Yep. Each one comes with two, and you can easily pack another two because they're so small. Mm -hmm. I could see them definitely changing the form factor, to your point, to something more sturdy. Um, durable, I believe, would probably yeah, durable would be yeah. a good way. But yeah, so I I definitely think everyone improves some durability improvements. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Nintendo probably would say like, if you're a true gamer who wants the better ones, then go get the Pro Controller. Yeah, because uh, I will say playing like fast Twitch games, like I'm thinking especially of um, Hades on the Joy-Con sucked. Yes, <laughs> like that was like. Um, I'm getting myself carpal tunnel in about two minutes using this. Please give me an actual controller. Well, that, um, that's that's one of the many games where, even if I, you know, if I decided to uh, take it out of the cradle and play it kind of like in a different room in in the 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 house, I would have the the switch, and then I'd have a pro controller with me. Oh, I totally did that. When I go to bed, I'd have like a little mount for the Switch mm -hmm. and I would have the Pro Controller because, mm -hmm. I mean, the Joy-Cons just are not good for that type of gameplay. Yeah. But I still think Nintendo is going to emphasize in some way that family slash party gaming atmosphere. Oh, yeah. Because um, it's really the only console that does that if you think about it. Like, you're not... Typically now buying a PlayStation or Xbox to do hot seat gaming. I mean, I, I know some games can, but it's certainly not a selling a rarity point. now. Whereas There's... the Nintendo, I mean, that's still like, I mean, for my old school's eSports lab, one of the reasons we got those switches is for that exact reason. Because mm -hmm. um, it's really easy to play local games like that. Super Smash Brothers, Mario Kart. You have that stupid duck game. Um, so I think... Nintendo will still want to do whatever format they come at. Yeah. Some kind of family party type of gameplay ability, whatever that looks like. Well, the other thing is, and, and, and I think that this is another reason why I don't think they change formats all that much, if at all, is the fact that you can, you can put the switch and the cradle, the charger and an HDMI cord in your carry on and then set that bad boy up and have that full gaming experience. It's not like trying to um, bring your PlayStation 5 somewhere and that filling up your entire piece of luggage, you know? Well, that's what it's convenient. Yeah, when I went with my friends, that's a couple of us just have to throw our Switch, and it's just a tiny little carrying case. Like, yep. it basically requires no extra bandwidth. Um, the only I could see potential wrinkle, hmm. which might... So, just think about development cycles. They're probably developing it before whatever the next iteration is before like we're even hearing about it. Right. Um, would be the success of the Steam Deck. And that if you think about what Nintendo did with like the Wii, the Wii U, well, I mean, you can debate the success of the Wii U yeah. and the Switch, like they were like groundbreaking in that ecosystem that they did. Yeah. But now if they come up with a Switch too, you could argue that it's now in direct competition with the Steam Deck. And mm -hmm. we know the Steam Deck is more powerful than the Nintendo. I mean, it's slightly different. Right. I think they're aiming for, I get that. 
But that's kind of been Nintendo's MO over the last couple of consoles has differentiate themselves. And they wouldn't be differentiating themselves if they come out with another handheld because of what um, Valve has been pretty dang successful now with the, and now all these other companies are trying to do the same thing. So that would be my only hang up with a, them doing the same thing twice is they tend to change things up, but we'll see what happens. Um, I mean, I think the most logical step is just a more powerful switch, but right. that's also, I'm not making a million dollars making those choices. This is true. None of us are. Yeah. Um, so I think that I do think though, if they do switch to the biggest thing is they got to keep that battery alive because that is definitely one of the selling points. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and also the, um, the, oh crap. Now I can't remember the name of the, the type of charger, but you could, you don't have to have your. Nintendo Switch charger. It's the USB C charger. Yeah, just, exactly. So you can use USB C. Because that, that was definitely thinking ahead of its time. Because even at the time, like USB C was not really ubiquitous at all, like four years ago. Yeah. And now um, it's become like the standard. So that was super smart on there is not to use like something proprietary or like USB B. That really should have connected that people still use. Right. No, micro USB. Uh, hmm. Or something dumb. So, yeah, I'm hoping it, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Now, speaking of Switch and games, um, there was a report um, recently in the last couple of days that, ha that has uh, stated that Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom has now sold over 18 million copies. Not hard to believe. It's really effing impressive. <laughs> 18 mil is quite a bit. Rimblade apparently is about to start his Baldur's Gate 3 experience. Yeah, everything I've read about Baldur's Gate 3 is it's like, just don't play anything for the next year. Yes. Uh, I've also heard that if you had the, uh, the early access, uh, unfortunately, you're better off just deleting your save file from that and starting anew. Yeah, that's always tricky because they think of like early access. So most early access games I've played, mm -hmm. single player games at least, your characters carry over. Yeah. Um, Baldur's Gate doesn't surprise me with the way they did early access. It was very, it almost seemed like a demo, um, the way they did it. Oh, never um, mind. Rimblade says that it is required that you I don't... start from scratch. I thought you had the ability to continue with it but even mm. all the better um as as a i guess used to be developer i could totally understand that um uh that your save file from an early access um version of the game may not gel completely with the the gold um the the full release I those saves like are not compatible I wonder, did they let gamers know that in early access, though? Because a lot of early access games, your saves carry over with no problem. Um, because, let's be honest, a lot of early access games on Steam, yeah. I know we talked about, they're basically, it's a continuous integration cycle of gaming now, where they're just continuously making it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. That's just a different development cycle. Rimblade says they changed a good bit of the early part. So, I mean, that makes sense. Um, you know, if, like I said, if, when you're, oh, okay. So several okay. times during early access, uh, you had to delete your save. So pretty uh, obvious. So the, then, then everyone was based really aware of it. So, um, it does seem to be a bit big different because in the, I mean, I know they're, I don't think they're technically a AAA developer, but in those big developer titles, it almost always is that your early access or beta, whatever you want to call it, don't carry over. I think it's usually these smaller indie more titles where I see that they carry over. Right. Rimblade passed yeah, on it's... the early access himself. I My go, go Zealish. I, th I, I know I've talked about this before in the show, but my problem with big, big games like Boulder's Gate, and they make no illusions that it's a big open game. Yep. I just get overwhelmed. I'm like, I want my linear storytelling. Is that too much to ask? Which I know is not 
what you play Baldur's Gate for. Well, I, you know, this is this this brings up an interesting topic, Zelius, that that I keep forgetting to ask you about. So you have an issue with open world games, yet you are an MMO player. So Look, how does that work for you? I didn't say that it made sense, okay? <laughs> um, however, I will say for the most part in, okay, in my own trying to legitimize my MMO playing, I guess the way I look at it, so if you actually look at the way I play MMOs, I play pretty linearly, meaning that, okay, let's just take Final Fantasy XIV, for instance, and I play yeah. my character, I'm basically playing the main story quest. Mm -hmm. If I have to do some quest, I might do it like in the main hubs of the MSQ, the main story quest. I will say though, because I'm not one of those gamers in MMOs who goes in, goes to a random village to complete the quest there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I'm not, that's why I haven't really played Final Fantasy 14 since I kind of got through the majority of like the main story, like, well, I, beat the MSQ, but all the main stuff, I beat. So I didn't do, I guess, what I would consider the equivalent of the open world MMO stuff with all the other things, because like people are like, Glamours are in-game, um, and all these other different things you can do. I right. never got into those. Um, so I guess that's where I look at my gameplay style of MMOs. I, do, I probably play them pretty linearly as far as MMOs go. I don't go too off the far off the beat, too far off the beaten path. Beaten path. Yeah. And also what a lot of MMOs do now is they give you like um daily quest. So you sign on, you sign on, it's like, oh, I'm gonna do a random dungeon. I can quickly jump in and jump out. So you don't even really have to think about like what are you doing? You just mm -hmm. do it. Um yeah, so like Riblet, yeah. So I'm not one of those people who explore every little nuance trying to, you know, break the map and go to places where I'm not going to. Um, I definitely did that in the early days of World of Warcraft. I remember trying to find places that you weren't supposed to go. But I think it then was also like a novelty back in the day because, like, you didn't really have open world games back then. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely tried to break the map in early WoW and see what happened. And you're like finding like a glitch and do like weird drop downs. Um, Zelius, I'm I'm 100 sure that if you even attempted to play uh, Legend of Zelda: Tears of the Kingdom, your brain would just melt. Oh, I I I've played I've tried playing the first Zelda on Switch, um, Breath of the Wild. They, I've tried it like three different times, and I can't get past more than like two hours. And I just get bored, honestly. Rimblade said, I may or may not have been teleported out of a few different places <laughs> via GMs. And wow, I, I'll i be totally honest with you. I I had to get teleported out twice uh, in the small sample size that I played of WoW because I kept finding ways to get stuck between a, a hills and trees. And I was a, what was it, a Shadow Elf? And that's why they added the slash stuck command. Yeah. <laughs> Teleport you back to Liang. That absolutely happened. Good times. Good times. <laughs> it, it, it's just, uh, it's just funny that Zelius is the one who plays all the MMOs, and I am the one who loves open world, but I can't stand playing MMOs. Yeah, it's sometimes it's just how it works. There isn't always logic to it. It's just. There you go. So apparently somebody um, uh, turned off the, the user limit in a Team Fortress 2 game and allowed for 100 people to log in at, at one time, and it was utter chaos. The server, I'm guessing, probably broke at some point. Yeah, I'm, I think, I mean, it, it was the, the video that they were showing basically everyone was moving at a snail's pace. It just kept, you know, going super duper slow and then would like speed up and then super duper slow. Yes. Rimblade. It what it did look insane. I do miss a little bit of the old days of playing TF2 in this, um, 16 V 16 maps. And mm -hmm. it's just a giant tunnel of death matchiness. Um, it was almost like the Halishin days of FPSs. Um, 
because it was all, I mean, if you're never playing Team Fortress 2, keep in mind that it's virtually all servers managed by just people like me and you, just regular mods. Right. Um, so back then when I was playing, like it was purely up to the server and the server mods mm -hmm. as far as what did it look like. And it's kind of funny because we talk a lot now about like, you know, the toxicity of, you know, games, especially PvP games. Mm -hmm. Um, and I played it. I mean, you know me, I played a lot of Team Fortress 2 back in the day. Yeah. And like I rarely had toxic encounters. I just really didn't like they were all good positive gameplay experiences back in that day um i, I mean I, I just think i think part of it is that you, you know you would choose your your server right and yeah I mean, you, you, and, and, and so you like kind it. of put yourself in a in a, a nice cocoon where the toxicity is you know it's not gonna be that bad where it's it's like <laughs> okay here here's a weird analogy it's like the difference between swimming in a private pool versus a public pool. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> uh, Rimblay says, yeah, I miss the old Battlefield 2 servers that were player run. Yeah. Was Battlefield the one where it was like 60 versus 60 or something? Uh, was, there were a couple. Or is it, no, is that Planet Side I'm thinking of? Might be Planet Side. I did it's Planet Side. That was like huge matches. That's just too yeah. insane for me. I I can't, I can't deal with so many people. Then again, I don't really deal well with multiplayer games. Period. Well, I tried it once, and I was like, "Oh, this is like actually organized, like or it's supposed to be organized." But that way, where you're supposed to be like playing it size yeah. was a lot bigger than sixty four. Well, okay, yeah, even more reason I, yeah. for I me tried, not I'm to like, play. That's too much. I do <laughs> too much brain melting. Cannot take it. Right, the planet size, the MMO, sure. Um, mm. But yeah. Uh, now, speaking of a game that's online always, and Zeely plays a shit ton of it, at least last time I checked, he plays a shit ton of it, Diablo 4 seems to have run into a small issue with certain uh, uh, players being able to bring their eternal character into the seasonal content. I haven't heard anything about that, but I wouldn't be surprised. Now, for those out there who don't know what se uh, eternal versus seasonal, Zealys will explain. Um, so, like most action RPGs do nowadays, is you have a eternal character, which basically means you can use them in their own independent league. And then as a subset of that, you now have what are called seasons. Um, different games call them different things, but those just call them seasons. And the idea of each season usually lasts two to three months, and they're entirely new characters they have to create for that season, so you can't use your eternal character. Now, you can play your eternal character at the same time, but it's an entirely different world. Basically, do two different reasons. One is they can add in new, like, um, ways to interact with the world. So, for instance, in Diablo, we have it called Malignant Hearts, where you can get, like, different ways to socket your gear for different abilities and stuff, which are different than your eternal characters. And in a game, if it actually has trading, which Diablo really doesn't, so it doesn't help. Um, but again, for instance, like Path of Exile, a big thing is the economy. Because in the eternal economy, since it's literally since day one, like the economy becomes stagnant. Mm -hmm. uh, versus if you have seasons, it's continually, in theory, revitalizing your economy every couple of months is the other intent behind it. Right. Uh, and you also hopefully get players trying new builds and different things also in seasons by replaying characters. Um, now, I don't know why you want to bring your eternal character to the seasonal realm. I don't know. So you can have uh, a jump start on levels? I guess. I don't know. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I did post uh, the link to the story uh, in the chat if anyone's curious and wanted to read more about it. Um, I'm going to guess that's probably pretty easy for Blizzard to figure out, like, oh, you brought your character over. And I imagine it's going to get the massive ban hammer would be my assumption. I mean, that's just pretty, if that's really what's happening, that's pretty abundantly clear. That is not an intended use of the game and uh, will not make Blizzard happy. 
there's probably well I don't know can they <clears throat> like basically I guess they would they would just you know knock that character out or toggle whatever switch they forgot to flip so that it can't get back into seasonal I would guess I don't know hmm. what do I know I know nothing um but you know, always a fun thing. You have know, Blizzard, Activision, and all the screwy <laughs> stuff they do. I feel like it's they... actually kind of a funny. It's actually kind of a funny bug. Yeah. Uh, basically, you join a party with an eternal care. You're eternal, mm -hmm. and you're playing with a seasonal character, and you join a party together as the eternal character. You disconnect, and now you can join a seasonal game, basically. But. So there's no I mean, that's one of those like edge cases you probably never think of testing. Let's be like, I would not think of testing guys at edge case thought. It makes sense. I mean, like, as a coding thing, like, okay, I could definitely see how that happened, mm -hmm. but it's not probably something I would have thought of actually testing for. Right. So I'm like, eh, okay. Like, I don't even know. Yeah. So that's kind of a funny bug where I'm just like, yeah. Uh, real quick. Uh, Jackie and Trip, those that's my niece and nephew. They say hello. So I'm just saying hello to them so that they know that we are live and that they just got a shout out. Um and Did you be ready to now? Huh, no, yeah, for just a, a little bit. Um the uh I I my background has basically been in QA. I mean, that's really my bread and butter. And I can't tell you how many times it brings a smile to my face when I come to the developer with a bug and the developer res uh, replies with, well, no one would do it that way. Cause that, this sounds exactly like the developer going, no one would do it like that. And then you're just like, well, someone did it. And now that someone, thanks to, you know, the wonders of the internet and social media, basically let it out into the wild and now everybody who wants to you know give it a crack is going to do it see in the good old days you had to be like part of some super secret club to learn about these little hacks you had to dial into a bbs and it was like hitting under like some weird ascii code or something that you had to break into and the news didn't spread rapidly you know, every single time I think about ASCII code, I always think about those old walkthroughs that use like ASCII art. That, oh, ah, I miss those days. <laughs> yeah, I do remember those. those <sighs> so awesome. Um, in entertainment news, uh, it sounds like if anyone out there has Disney Plus, um, the there is a rumor about the Mandalorian season four. Um, that it will not be an actual series, but for, for the season four, it will actually just be a movie. And I don't know how I feel about that, but then again, like there, there are, I mean, anime do, does it a lot where, you know, they've got their, uh, anime series some of which you know run into like a thousand episodes but then they also have like those one-off movies that you could kind of place somewhere yeah Rimblade says it's just a wrap-up which i understand i mean uh from my understanding it was going towards uh you know running its course so well I may actually watch it because we are shortly coming on football season, which means I have to subscribe to a TV service. And I may actually get Hulu Live this time around. There you go. There you go. Which comes with Disney Plus. Um, so I may actually do that for my football needs and then actually get into some of the Disney crap. Yeah. I mean, there's a, and there's a lot of Disney stuff. And uh, well, I said that was always kind of my plan was wait for Disney Plus to be out a couple of years, get yep. some, you know, library. And now that it's been around for a while, now I'm like, all right, might actually time to jump in. Speaking of anime, um, uh, Netflix released a trailer or I guess a teaser trailer for the um, the live action One Piece TV series. Uh, One Piece is that anime that literally does not die. Um I think I want to say at last check, I want to make sure that I've got 
One Piece anime. Ah, I hit the wrong button. Anime. Oh my goodness gracious. Anime series uh, episode number. They are at. Oh crap. How many? Uh, 1,070 episodes. That's a lot. Yes. Uh, Rimblade says, I've got a little hope for the One Piece live action. All I got to say is in the One Piece live action, stay true to the material. Do not try to be like Cowboy Bebop and try to reinvent the fucking wheel and screw it up real bad. Um, Rim Rimblades, and this is one of the reasons why I have hope for the uh, One Piece is that nothing can... It's in the contract. Nothing could be released without the full okay of the One Piece creator. Ah. So they sign. Uh, they, that was part of the deal. They can't just t- they, they can't do what Hollywood usually does, which is take an IP and then put the Hollywood spin on it, which of course ine- inevitably means you're going to have the U.S. Army or some military arm in there that has no right to be in the. The movie, but they're going to do it anyways because it's America. What is One Piece about? It's about a band of pirates being led by um, uh, Monkey D. Luffy, uh, who's eaten a uh, devil fruit, which gives him um, basically he's a rubber man. Uh, he could stretch. <laughs> um, he could stretch himself out and do like crazy stuff. But the problem with the devil fruit, which is not m- that much of a spoiler, but if you take the devil fruit to give you special powers, you can no longer swim, which is kind of weird if you want to be a pirate because you're going to be on the ocean. So if you fall into the water, you're going to drown unless someone can save you. Uh, rim blades. Um, <laughs> uh, when I was talking about Hollywoodizing things, he said, cough, cough, uh, Transformers. Yes, yes, absolutely freaking yes. And to be honest with you, I don't think of those any of those movies as Transformers. I think it is... Uh, the America U.S. Army with some robots running around. It went downhill when Megan Fox left the series. It went downhill as soon as it was apparent, abundantly apparent, that there was more emphasis on the U.S. military uh, and not as much on the actual robots. My problem is, like, I, in all seriousness, like, it was actually hard to follow the action for me. Because, like, you had usually have, like, two pretty monochrome-looking robots yep. fighting each other, trying to do, like, the Jason Bourne shaky cam style. Mm-hmm. And I just, like, bang, bang, explosion, explosion. Like, I assume one of the robots won, but I honestly couldn't tell you which because they look the same. And they're just gray and boring and metallic. Come on, it's Michael Bay, man. All all you got to worry about is the explosions. Yeah. There were explosions. This is true. Ooh. Rimblade said, still want a release date for X-Men 97 on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I'll get there eventually. Yeah. Um... All right, uh, we're going to pause for just a second to do uh, a shout out to all those amazing people who help Alter Confusion be the best that we could be. And those are the friends of the show. So without further ado, and because I actually fixed the freaking backgrounds now, let's see. Ooh, that's <laughs> Whatever. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's start off our shout outs with the Indie Cluster. The Indie Cluster is an organization of independent game developers that want to gain exposure by being involved in the community. They collectively journey to popular conferences as a traveling booth to help gain attention for their games. They make partnerships in local communities to bring games to the mainstream mindset. They highlight local, unusual, and rare concepts that challenge the paradigm of the common. They also host events to teach kids and minority groups about game development to hopefully one day enter the industry themselves. If you want more information, go to IndieCluster.com. Now this next shout-out we got to give is to... uh, uh, an AV master, and that, of course, is Noodle Boy Media. 
Founded in 2015 by Andrew Tran, Noodle Boy Media, previously White Kid 47 Media, is your choice for professional photo shoots and panel recordings at conventions. They pride themselves in providing a high level of professionalism, top-notch experiences, and quality services. If you want more information and to view their full list of services, check out facebook.com slash noodleboymedia. Now, this next one is super-duper important if you are in the Atlanta area and you are a gamer, and maybe you get a couple of those aches and pains because of long gaming sessions. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you about Hero Chiropractic. Hero Chiropractic is a unique healthcare practice set up by Ryan Moore, the company's focus to elevate a patient's experience of freedom, creative expression, and joy. They believe that everyone can be a hero and has incredible heroic potential inside themselves waiting to be unleashed. Hero Chiropractic focuses on mobile chiropractic care in the greater Atlanta area. They are committed to healing clients by creating a plan of action uniquely suited for each person. They make that plan of action as convenient and affordable as possible and most importantly suited to your individual needs. For more information, go to HeroChiropractic.com. Now let's talk about the music maestro himself, ladies and gentlemen. Need a new logo or want to work on a full branding and content strategy? Or maybe you need music or audio for your content, just like Alter Confusion. Crosspad Creative offers a whole host of solutions for individuals and small businesses. Just email josh at crosspadcreative at gmail.com and see what he can do for you. Which reminds me, I still need to email him something. And the final shout out we got to give is to the OG. This is the original backer for Alter Confusion. That, of course, is Agile Axiom. By day, Axe leads both a development team and system administration team working with satellites at NASA's Goddard campus. But while not in meetings and many times during, he is the agile evangelist, Agile Axe, championing the philosophy of agile and trying to make the world a better place for software developers, testers, system admins, and software projects the world over. Decades of experience and software development and leading agile teams are brought to bear against evil processes inefficient work, and bad habits. For more information, go to agileaxiom.com. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know that there's quite a few of you out there who have to be asking yourselves, how do I become a friend of the show? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to tell you uh, so that you can uh, become said friend of the show. And ladies and gentlemen, we do that through Patreon. Alter Confusion survives on love and support of fans like you, and so we have a Patreon page. Pa Patreon lets you, the fans, lovers, haters, the gods, interdimensional beings, gods, demons, aliens, werewolves, vampires, mummies, swamp creatures, supporters, and more to become active participants of the work we love through a monthly membership. This gives you access to exclusive content, community, and insight into our creative process. In exchange, we gain a bit more freedom to do our best work and the stability we need to build an even stronger creative career. Currently, we have two tiers uh, that you can subscribe to. The first tier is a $1 tier. That's $1 a month or $12 a year. And that gains you early access to all the playthroughs as well as the ability to participate in patron-only posts. Now, if you're feeling a little bit frisky and you want to actually have a shout out during the Alter Confusion Thursday Night Hangouts, there's the $5 level. That's $5 a month or $60 a year. Not only do you get everything at the $1 level, but you also gain your name or organization added to the Friends of the Show section of Every Single Thursday Night Hangout. So if you want to become a patron of Alter Confusion, go to Patreon. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash Altered Confusion. Now, of course, the other shout out we always have to give because this is super duper 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 important. And if uh, Alter Confusion raises uh, $90 in the month of August, we get a, uh, a cool tabletop um, accessory, which would be awesome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Alter Confusion is proud to say that we have been fundraising for Extra Life for 12 straight years. Extra Life is gamers doing what they do best game to help sick and injured children at their chosen children's miracle network hospital the money that we raise through the extra through extra life will go directly to children's health care of atlanta as unrestricted funds this means that the hospital decides where and how to spend the money to ensure the dollars we raise make the biggest impact in the lives of the kids they treat so if you have the capacity to donate please go to extra-life.org and search for altered confusion all right, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not exactly sure. Zelius, 
It looks like you have a filter on your camera now, but we're just going to keep going. Really? Yeah. Anyways. Maybe I'm filtering out the ambient light of evil. Possibly. Possibly. Okay. So, um, quick um, shout out. Uh, one of the other um, games that we saw at Momocon uh, is a game called Bug and Seek. It is an educational uh, game uh, where the main objective of the game is to catch these bugs that are in the city and they collect them to put into these like display cases to try to raise money and, and bring the, uh, I can't remember exact term of, of the, the building, but I assume uh, that's the thing. yes, it is. I'm pretty sure it is. I mean, it's bug and seek. Yeah. I so, yeah. so peculiar. That's it. That's exactly it. So cool. peculiar. Yep. So uh, they currently are doing a Kickstarter uh, for those interested. I know that I've already Kickstarted, and I highly recommend that you do, especially if you have kids, because this is not only is the game pretty easy to pick up, but you also learn a little bit about the bugs. Uh, and there's a lot of bugs to catch in this game. Um, so if uh, so, just head over to Kickstarter. Uh, Zelius has put uh, the link in the chat. But if you're listening to this or watching the recording, uh, go to kickstarter.com and search for Bug and Seek, and you, you'll you pull it up. Once again, the developer's name is so, so peculiar. Now, speaking of Kickstarter, Kickstarter has implemented a new requirement for all creators who want to post their project on Kickstarter. And this deals with something that we've talked about a lot. And that is that if you are a creator and you want to post your project, you will now have to disclose if you are going to be including AI generated content as part of your project. Zelius, thoughts? Like I always go back to like what they what do they actually define as AI? Right. Um, because like developers everywhere are using chat GT chat GPT GTP GTP. GPT. Thank you. I was like GPT. Yeah. Sure. Um, to help with code or write code or do it all. Mm -hmm. Um so I think that's the tricky part is like people aren't just writing, you know, a million lines of code literally by hand nowadays. Right. They're getting some kind of outside help. Um, or you like, I always bring up the Photoshop one, and there's now a Photoshop add-on where, you know, we talk about like Photoshopping a face on. And, you know, you can argue back in the day you had to do it yourself. You get your little lips and draw it around. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, like, the add-on to basically Photoshop a face, you don't actually have to know what you're doing. Like it literally does it for you. Right. Which is obviously artificial intelligence. Um, like I saw there was a college, I can't remember what college it is off the top of my head, but it's a big one. It's like an actual real university mm -hmm. um, where they say like for your college admissions, you're allowed to use chat GTP or other ones. Like you have to say you are, mm -hmm. but they're like, yeah, and their argument, which is something I kind of agree with, is you know these people are going to use this in the real world. Let's be real, re realistic about how people are using technology. Right. Um. Because that's the thing is people applying to college, like you're kind of doing yourself a disservice, honestly, if you're not like running your own resumes through some kind of online algorithm to make sure it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Um. So. It's that murky world. I get why they're, I mean, I get why Kickstarter is doing it, um, of why they're having that now. Yeah. It, but it, this is going to kind of continue to be what happens. Right. Is it's going to continue to have this ongoing AI because the cat's out of the bag and you sure as hell are putting it in it. Agreed. I think, you know, it, this is kind of a, uh... I mean, it, Kickstarter hasn't gotten in trouble for this, but it is kind of like a CYA thing so that, you know, if somebody who backed a, a project goes, wait a minute, this isn't, this was, well, <laughs> there there might be some artists out there going, whoa, wait a minute, this looks a lot like my art 
was sampled to create this. So now you give it, you know, you give the the individual who's actually backing the, you know, the 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 fine print of look, th there's stuff that's being generated by not humans, and so there might be, you know, the the possibility that actually you I want to know if you if you admit or disclose that you're you that you're using AI generated content especially when it comes to actually help any any content what happens if uh, an IP infraction occurs or you know you have a copyright violation once once the product is out the door because with Kickstarter you're not going to I mean yes some some creators will give you uh, detailed updates and give you screenshots and stuff, but others may just be writing, you know, soliloquies to you uh, every yep. once in a while to keep you in the loop, but you won't know until you actually get your hands on it. So I wonder like how most, that works. And like most things, I think it kind of depends on what it is. Like if it's a computer game, I can care less if it's written by AI. I mean, if the Terminator T2000 came back and wrote the next. You know, Bowler's Gate 4 and had it ready for me tomorrow, cool. Mm -hmm. But in time, as we've talked about, when it's like more personal things like artwork hanging on my wall or music that I can watch like live, mm -hmm. it's that artistic talent from that way where it's like, yes, I want to know like an actual human being with flesh and blood created this. Right. No, I, I think I think the the one area that I mean Kickstarter has really cracked down on this, but is uh does like art book collections where you have mm. a, a, a book full of original artwork, which turns out that is, yes, uh, it was generated by AI. So technically it is original because it's sampling a bunch of things and then doing like a composite, but at the same time, it wasn't an, an actual, uh, flesh to blood human being who created it. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. All I'll say is that I have kickstarted two projects in the past 30 days. Uh, oh, look at you! Uh, flawed the card game. Actually come to fruition. Flawed the card game and then Bug and Seek uh, by So Peculiar. Nice. Uh, to, and I promise that the Bug and Seek interview from Momocon is going to be released within the next uh, probably four or five days. I just need to post it and, and write up a blurb and then it will be there. Um, and by the way, Bugging Seek has 120 backers mm -hmm. and has pledged six thousand six hundred ninety-six dollars of the eighteen thousand dollar goal. And they just started, I think, two days ago or three days ago. So it's it it's off to a good start. And if you get a thousand dollars, you can give a bug in quest in the game. Yeah. You get to become a resident and design your own NPC. Isn't that kind of cool? I'm trying to remember what level I pledged at. I hope you gave the uh, $1,000 one. I no, think it's I did not. <laughs> I did not. I think I did the uh, the all-in one, which is a digital art book of every bug of the game, an exclusive backers-only style for the six bug tank plus one of these tanks to start the game, exclusive backers-only bug hunter outfit, all unlocked stretch gold DLCs and my name in the credits. Nice. I love seeing my name in the credits. That that makes me happy. I can't tell you how many. Well, actually, hell, all of the Nerd Burger game uh, uh, Kickstarters that I've backed have my name in there. And hell, Pugmire's got my my dogs' names in there as backers. Because that was the cool thing to do, man. Cool. I want to go catch. You know what I miss doing? What's that? Catching lightning bugs in my front yard. Ah, those were the days. And then you go and put them in a jar, and then they had all died the next day. It was very sad. But it was cool uh, it for was. that for that little bit of time where that jar was lighting up, man. But that's what we did as kids, man. It's like we have these stupid little cell phones destroying our brain cells. Mm -hmm. We go out and use our brain cells outside. You could go outside after dark by yourself. What, what insanity is this? 
No, impossible, they say. I know, I know. My parents just, I don't think I had parents. I was allowed to leave the house. It's kind of crazy. Yes, yes. Uh, so there was an interesting uh, post that I ran across on one of the many websites that I visit. And they were talking about the importance of backgrounds in games where like be it um a, a you know a side scroller um and, you know with like an animated background so my the my immediate thing is to, to show how old i am let's just go with street fighter 2 where you had those people like cheering you on in the background doing the same animations over and over again but still giving you something and and i kind of it kind of made me think about all these games I play, and I I do think that, you know, animated or, you know, detailed backgrounds that you don't ever get to interact with uh, definitely do add stuff to the game. It kind of, you know, adds additional depth to it. Uh, a lot of the Castlevania games that were side-scrollers, you know, it, it, there wasn't a whole lot, but you might see, like, you know, a shadow of a bat fly through the the top of the screen or all the um uh the candles that were on the wall you'd see the flame flicker and you know i i agree i think that you know a a static background can be greatly improved by small animations like that i mean that makes sense it just gives some extra character to your especially you think of it back in the the, back in the day Mm -hmm. A lot of the game, like there were three D games where you had like landscapes and stuff. It's yeah. you had to, like that was your, I guess, landscape was yeah. your, you know, pixelated background. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right. I definitely do remember those uh, Street Fighter backgrounds of people cheering for you, or you played at Guile's place where you had the uh, the big jet in the background yep. which you flew in. Um, so yeah, those were. Pretty cool backgrounds, honestly. You know, think about it now. I didn't think about it at the time, but now it's like, yeah. It adds something, you know. It, it was it was not necessary, but it definitely added something. It, it hell, even now you've got um a lot of these fighting games out there that are in three dimensions, but you still have like the the actual background, and of course it is super duper animated. Uh there was a soul cal I don't remember which soul caliber it was, but there's you're basically fighting on like a stone octagon and the background is just these pillars with like a with waterfalls happening with you know like the the ivy crawling down the the pillars and it looked you know it 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 made that scene unique that 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 stage unique and kind of you know pulled you in i mean hell technically i mean you look at um you know overwatch and uh paladins you know there's there's a lot of window dressing that goes into it to make the the scene the the level come alive. Um, I mean, some of my favorite maps in Overwatch were because of the atmosphere due to the artwork. I mean, yes, the gameplay was important, obviously, but like, especially like those Christmas themed maps. Yeah, they were just cool to look at. Like Blizzard World is one of my favorite maps ever. It was actually a decent map to play on, but just. It was a very well done map thematically. Everything in it mm-hmm. was beautiful. Um, so I definitely do miss some of those playing Overwatch because so, there was a lot of, I think, beauty mm-hmm. in a lot of those original maps. I would definitely agree. And I, I do think that helps. I think one thing else, having good artwork, especially online games, can help with the longevity of the game. Yeah. Um, can kind of be like, ooh. But totally random. You're talking about Street Fighter Two. Yep. Maybe think of a movie I saw recently, which was better than I thought it would be by far. Uh huh. Tekken. Oh, you saw it? Much better than I thought it would be. Like I give it a solid seven, seven and a half out of ten. So, uh, how does it compare to the original Mortal Kombat? So Tekken actually has a more serious storyline. Okay. I mean, you know, Mortal Kombat, it really digs into its roots. Right. Um, as far as a classic fighter game, mm-hmm. I would definitely say that, like, it's hard to beat Mortal Kombat. But as far as, like, actually the acting, the uh, atmosphere, the props, like, mm-hmm. I think Tekken was actually better, I okay. would actually say. 
Um, but Mortal Kombat with, you know, the Mortal Kombat! Yep. It's just the harkening back to the original, and honestly, the popularity of Mortal Kombat yep. as a game franchise in itself. Uh, but as its own standalone movie, Tech is actually good. Where did you see it? It's actually, it's either on, no, it's, I'm pretty sure it's on Amazon Prime. Really? Might yeah, have to check that out then. Yeah, I mean, it's, like I said, it sold 7 out of 10. It's not, you know, the best thing ever, but it was certainly, I did not have any high expectations watching it. I was like, eh, I'll give it a shot, see what happens. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. Uh, yep, you're right. It's, uh, it is indeed on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they do it. They did do a little bit of the Street Fighter, where like they introduce the characters and they have fight. You know, more like Mortal Kombat disky type of fights, where like right. they're in the arena and stuff. So they do some of that in it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, good to know. Good to know. But yeah, uh, uh, Zelius, I'm assuming that you're still putting all your time into Diablo Four. Yeah, I didn't have much time. To, I don't know what I was even doing this week, but I didn't have much time to actually play video games this week. Yes. Um, I know it's terrible, man. Oh, I know what I was doing. It's my birthday week, so I was drinking out with good friends yes, all week. Yes, yes. Well, um, no, that's, so that's, that, that makes sense. That was definitely a thing. Um, yeah, but now I'm in high gear of trying to get my shit ready for Dragon Con. I understood. But so... I mean, how much of the, the seasonal content have you played for Diablo 4? I mean, it's tricky because once you've seen some of the seasonal content, you mm -hmm. like kind of know what's coming. Like, mm -hmm. it's kind of the same. Like, it's cool because, like, it changes your character and gives you different abilities. But, like, I've already seen most of, like, what there is to offer. Mm -hmm. so I'm kind of like, eh, I've already seen most of this. Um, so that's where maybe I'm not as interested as i might otherwise be i guess i don't know gotcha but i have a feeling that's how most arpgc i've not really played arpg seasonal content in other games but i get the first that's how most of them work like mm -hmm. once you kind of into content and how they all work it's like okay you've kind of seen it yeah gotcha. it's me. yeah see to me in my mind social media is uh is a detriment to seasonal content because I feel like a lot of you know the twists and turns and surprises mm. uh, as soon as the seasonal content goes live if you you it's damn near impossible to to you know not see all the the cool things that you can do be ruined by someone who who has more time than you have well, there's a reason, like, on Reddit, I don't follow the Diablo 4 Reddit anymore. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened. It just was like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, social media is fun when it comes to games. I'm still playing uh, Zelda. Hold up. Yeah. Uh, and Legends of Ruterra. And a little bit of Paladins. Nice. You look at you and your online games. Yeah. Well, Legend of Terra, I'm I'm playing Path of Champions, uh, and that's basically like a a single player, I guess, adventure where you you you're set up with a, a base deck, and as you move through, you add cards to your deck to try to beat the champion at the end of it. Uh, Paladins, because I'm playing with my sons, it's. Uh, us and up to three other human players and then five CPU players. Because I won't let my kids play uh, true PvP. What if they played it against you? Could you be like in the opposing opposition and let them know who's boss? You know, I don't know. I'm a little bit afraid to try that. Um... Though I'm pretty sure I could put them in their place if I really wanted to, uh, um, even even, so. even though I'm not, put, I don't put any time in it whatsoever. My son, uh, my eldest son, puts the most time into paladins. 
Uh, they did announce at Final Fantasy's Game Fest mm -hmm. um, Expo the new expansion, which is called Dawn Trail. Dawn Trail? All one word, sir. Dawn Trail. Oh. True. Um, the level cap is increased from level 90 to 100. There will be new skills. Very exciting. Um, and two new GPS roles. It's really all we have. Okay, so question for you: When they do a, a cap in in MMOs, when they when you see the the level cap raise in this example, ten levels, how how fast do you think on average does it take the first person to hit the the new cap? <laughs> I feel like uh, once it goes no. live, it like within uh, easily within twenty four hours, someone has gotten either close to it. Well, that's like the whole Diablo thing where like people are complaining like, oh, there's not enough content. Well, yeah, because you're sitting there sweaty palms playing 16 hours a day. If you're not doing like the awful DPS, you hate life as we know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's going to be people who go through it super duper quickly. Um, me, it'll probably take a while, honestly, to go to level 100. Right. Um, because each expansion, if you kind of take your time, I mean, you're talking a fair number of hours to go through it. It's not just a quick weekend of gameplay. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, that, because of their history, is going to be a day one purchase. Like, I know I'll be getting Dawn Trail uh, when it comes out. But that's from, from 2024. That's still a ways away. Yes. Um, um, oh, uh, I know that we're running a, a little running out of time, but I do want to say that I I read something um, that stated that if you get Starfield, uh, I think for the PC and you've got like the Xbox Anywhere subscription or whatever, that yes. you that you can uh, you don't have to buy a second copy to play on the Xbox. Ooh. I wish more games did that, honestly. Like, I would love to try Outriders on my PC, for instance. Yep. Um, I, I, it's one of my favorite FPSs, but I'm not going to buy it again for the PC. I'm just like, I don't care that much. Um, or, like, I would love to be able to swap my Final Fantasy XIV subscription to my PC or be able to, like, play on both. Like, oh, I feel like playing on PC or the play, PlayStation. I know it's not going to happen. Right. Uh, it would just be cool. Same thing with Destiny 2. Um, so some of these games, especially some of these uh, games as a service games have been going on for years, because now you start talking about like, which expansions do you own for each platform? And hell, even on PC, these MMOs, like Guild Wars 2 and Final Fantasy 14 that are split between the native launcher mm -hmm. and the Steam launcher have different licenses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like I, said, I know it's not going to happen. Uh, I'm not even asking for it. I just wish it was a thing. Cause... Dreamers could dream, baby. I'm just going to dream, man. Um, yeah. I will say, I most obnoxious thing ever was, I was trying to figure out what my Destiny 2, like, what license, like, what expansions I purchased, and it's like damn near impossible. Like, mm -hmm. they make it incredibly annoying to find. I was like, I just want to know what I own, man. That it, That would be nice. That would be nice. I do like, um, um, there's a couple of games that I have on, on Steam that I bought in early to like unlock all of the heroes. Yeah. And now it's like, for some of these games, it's like a hundred bucks to unlock all the heroes. I'm like, dude, I think I paid like 20 bucks, like when it first came out. Yeah. Or it could grind for many, many hours. Unlock them that way. No, thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think it's time for us to wrap up. So what I will say is I want to thank everyone for tuning into the Alter Confusion Thursday night hangout. For myself, Charlie, and Zelius, it's been a pleasure giving you to come our heads, our mouths, and, of course, our hearts. We'll be back next Thursday for another Alter Confusion Thursday night hangout. Remember, kids, keep on gaming in the free world. Amen to that, brother.